Solemnity of Our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe. The Solemnity of Christ the King marks the last Sunday of Ordinary Time, just before the opening of the new liturgical year in the Advent season. Rather than merely turning the page on the calendar, it coincides with a moment of grace to move into a new liturgical year with gratitude for the blessings received and also with hopes for future growth. The liturgy invites us to ask the question, is Jesus Christ really the King of my life? In ancient times, there were a number of ways that a king was present to his subjects. In the first place, through the symbols of the king, such as his flag or image on a coin. With Jesus, his great symbol is the crucifix, which reminds us that his reign is expressed through a self-giving, sacrificial love. Wearing a crucifix or placing it in our home or office is an important sign that we desire to belong to him. Secondly, a king made known his message by way of a decree. Christ the King communicates to us in a special way through his word contained in sacred scripture. By hearing or reading his words and implementing them in our lives, we reveal that we belong to Christ. A third way a king was present in his kingdom was through his ambassadors, his appointed advocates who could deliver the king's message. The Pope is the special representative of Jesus on this earth, but each of us, having accepted Jesus as our King, is called to share his message with other people. Finally, the greatest and most pleasing mode of the King's presence was the invitation and great honor to be in his personal company in his castle. Jesus Christ in the Eucharist is the equivalent to this form of presence. The church is his castle, and those who desire to be in the presence of their king seek his substantial presence in the Eucharist. As the liturgical calendar flips and a new year of grace begins, let us examine the ways that we can improve in allowing Jesus to completely reign over our lives. By proudly adorning his cross, by reading, hearing, obeying, and communicating his message, And by spending time in his Eucharistic presence, we can truly profess that Jesus is our King and that we proudly belong to his kingdom of perfect love. Ezekiel chapter 34 verses 11 to 12 and 15 to 17. As for you, my flock, I will judge between one sheep and another. Thus says the Lord God, I myself will look after and tend my sheep. As a shepherd tends his flock when he finds himself among his scattered sheep, so will I tend my sheep. I will rescue them from every place where they were scattered when it was cloudy and dark. I myself will pasture my sheep. I myself will give them rest, says the Lord God. The lost I will seek out. The strayed I will bring back. The injured I will bind up. The sick I will heal. But the sleek and the strong I will destroy, shepherding them rightly. As for you, my sheep, says the Lord God, I will judge between one sheep and another, between rams and goats. The Word of the Lord. God is often described as a shepherd in the Old Testament. At the time of the writing most of the people had an understanding of what a shepherd was supposed to do for the flock in his care. When we move forward to Psalm 23 we hear David refer to God as his shepherd, protector, and confidant. In Psalm 23, King David recognized that Israel had only one true king and shepherd and that position was held, not by him, but by the one true God, and the coming Messiah. The religious leaders should have been Israel's shepherds, but they cared more about themselves than the people they should have been serving, and leading to God. Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 1 and 2, 
Woe to the shepherds who mislead, and scatter the flock of my pasture, says the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, against the shepherds who shepherd my people, you have scattered my sheep, and driven them away. You have not cared for them, but I will take care to punish your evil deeds. Ezekiel 34 verse 2 reads, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, in these words prophesy to them to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been pasturing themselves. Should not the shepherds, rather, pasture sheep? Henry Ward Beecher, 1813-1887, wrote, Christianity works while infidelity talks. Christianity feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, visits and cheers the sick, and seeks the lost, while infidelity abuses her and babbles nonsense and profanity. By their fruits you shall know them. The shepherds of Israel talked about God and his ways but did not allow them to enter their lives thus leading to God's judgment, invasions of Babylon and Assyria. God promises to take over as the good shepherd of the scattered sheep and restore them to the flock. In a little over 600 years Jesus arrived and sought out those who were scattered, the tax collectors, prostitutes, the very people the religious leaders believe couldn't be saved. Jesus, the good shepherd, doesn't condemn sinners but attempted to restore and guide them back into God's flock. He cured the crippled, made the weak strong, he watched over, and taught justice to those who follow him. Jesus will return again but this time to judge, to separate, the good from the bad and give to each their just reward or punishment. Too many leaders act as if the sheep, their people, are there for the benefit of the shepherd, not that the shepherd has responsibility for the sheep. Ken Blanchard The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Beside restful waters he leads me, refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. The Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes You anoint my head with oil My cup overflows The Lord is my shepherd There is nothing I shall want Only goodness and kindness follow me days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall Psalm 23 verses 1 to 6. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In verdant pastures he gives me repose. Beside restful waters he leads me, he refreshes my soul. He guides me in right paths for his name's sake. 
You spread the table before me in the sight of my foes, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Only goodness and kindness follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The 23rd Psalm is probably the most famous and well known of all 150 Psalms. Think about a shepherd watching over his flock. The shepherd takes care of all their needs. In return the sheep love the shepherd because they know the shepherd loves them. The sheep like innocent children will follow the shepherd because they know all that he has done for them. You woke up this morning because God wanted you to. You are alive now because God wants you to be. Have you thanked him for all that he has given you? God is love. First Corinthians chapter 15 verses 20 to 26 and 28. Christ will hand over the kingdom to his God and Father, so that God will be all in all. Brothers and sisters, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through man, the resurrection of the dead came also through man. For just as in Adam all die, so too in Christ shall all be brought to life. But each one in proper order, Christ the first fruits, then, at his coming, those who belong to Christ, then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to his God and Father, when he has destroyed every sovereignty and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. When everything is subjected to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to the one who subjected everything to him, so that God may be all in all. The Word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 has often been called by some, the resurrection chapter. The resurrection of both Christ and his followers is a recurring theme. The term fallen asleep, is a Hebrew phrase meaning death. First fruits, is a term mentioned in the Old Testament Passover ritual, in which God instructs the people to bring the first ripened fruits, of the harvest to the priests in the temple, on the day following the High Holy Sabbath of Passover, which is also known as Easter Sunday. Bringing the first fruits to the temple showed God's ownership of the entire crop, the offering is an acknowledgement that none of the crop would have come into being without God's help. Christ was the first fruit of the new covenant planted by God in Israel. Jesus was tried by the high priest on Good Thursday. Their judgment led to his cross of crucifixion on Good Friday. He was the seed, that fell to the ground, and was buried in the tomb. He emerged from the ground on Sunday, the day following Saturday or the High Holy Jewish Sabbath, which was the traditional day of offering the first fruits, or as we know it Easter Sunday morning. The resurrection of Jesus shows God the Father's acceptance of him as the perfect first fruits offering. Easter Sunday is also the time the apostles and disciples came to understand Jesus' predictions of his death and resurrection. Christ was the first fruits, and being the first indicates that other followers would also be resurrected from the dead and raised to a new life. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. Adam's fall brought death into the world but in Jesus all will be raised, some to a reward and others to judgment. Theologians often substantiate this belief with Romans 5 verses 18 to 19, then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with first fruits of all your produce. Proverbs 3 verse 9 This quote seems to support the once saved always saved, or salvation through faith alone theories. Daniel chapter 12 verse 2 reads, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Shame and everlasting contempt certainly does not indicate salvation through faith alone. In today's reading chapter 15 verse 25 reads, For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. In the Old Testament enemies were Israel's surrounding nations. 
but in the New Testament there is a shift in the use of the word enemies from the surrounding nations to individuals opposed to God. Satan, the tempter, the accuser, and his helpers are opposed to God, and search for ways to upset God's plans and to lead God's people into sin. The resurrection of Jesus defeated the powers of Satan, it was an indication of God's complete victory over death that will occur at Jesus' second coming. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good, his love endures forever. 1 Chronicles 16 verse 34
Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was unhungered, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Good morning. Well, you know, every time I hear this gospel, I always think, those poor goats have got a deal. That's the truth, isn't it? Separates the sheep from the goats, and the goats are out the door. And I, and I don't think that the, the, the Lord emphasized that, as, but that's the first thing I think of. I'm sorry. Anyway. Uh, you know, I, as I said before at the beginning of the Mass, when we talk about here we celebrate Feast of Christ the King, and we as Americans have no real concept of what kingship is. I remember quite a few years ago I was in, in London, and uh, there the Queen was doing some sort of parade, or I, don't know, I think it was her birthday, or so. I don't know what it was. But I mean, she was, she was coming through the streets, you know, not, not coming through the streets, in her little cart and everything else. And the people were just, oh, it's just, a, and I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. Uh, you know, and they closed the stores for this that type of deal. Uh, and it was just, it was one of those things that uh, I, I didn't really grasp hold of uh, until I saw the response of the people about how, what they, what they saw in the queen. Uh, and, and the idea of royalty. You know, years ago, and that's one of the reasons what separated the United States from the British colonies, is when the, the, the British crown, they owned all the property. That's one of the problems they had with Ireland. When they took over Ireland, all of a sudden the people that were living on the property, this is mine. This is the king's. Poof, get off of it. Or you'll, you have to pay taxes. Or the taxes you have to pay rent. It wasn't even, all your property was gone. The king owned everything, but he provided, supposedly provided everything. And so, what do we hear in the first reading today? We hear in the first reading, we're hearing the, the aspect of, of God is the, the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd who provides it. I, you know, Jesus didn't get this from anything. He got it from the Old Testament. He says, that God, God is, the, is the good shepherd. He provides for, for his sheep. His sheep know him. His, he takes care of them. He, he loves them. He, he con he's concerned with their well-being. And every, everything that they need will be taken care of. And then in, the, in that first reading, and he says, and, and it's unlike the kings of our days, who, who, who use, these, use the, their servants as as just servants who use their, their people as, 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 and misuses them and abuses them and, and doesn't even feed them and they don't have enough to eat and enough to drink or whatever. And it goes on and on about that. That's what, what that first reading says. He says, God is the good shepherd and he's going to get rid of all these kings. Get rid of all these people in, in power. And he's going to treat them 
as a shepherd. Wow. When you really put it in those terms, then you, you start to think about, what's the celebration here that Jesus Christ, the king of the universe? And, and, and the celebration, of course, Paul talks about it as well in the second reading. He says he dies and rises from the, from the dead and he, is, he will put himself on the throne. He will be on the throne judging, judging who has done good and who has done bad. And then he will hand over his kingdom to God, God the Father, and say, this is the true kingdom. This is the kingdom that you deserve. This is the, the people that you deserve. The ones who have been mistreating others, forget them. So it goes right into what this gospel reading today is. As you've heard this gospel reading, you know, the separate the sheep from the goats. I love it because it turns around and it says, in the last days, in the end, we're all going to be facing the Lord. And we're all going to be standing there saying, what have I done? What have I done? Have I been, have I, have I, have I looked into me? Or if I looked out to my brothers and sisters. And he does, you'll hear this, he doesn't judge. You know, the two commandments, what are the two greatest commandments? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And to love your neighbor as yourself. If you noticed, he judges. The only, the whole focus of this gospel is he judges on that second commandment. But the most important one is the to love the Lord your God with all your heart, right? That's, the, that's number one. Well, well, the ones that are, us that are standing there have already gotten that part, haven't we? We've already, uh, we've, uh, we, and, you know, this gospel writer is to speaking to those who have either, either a Jewish who knew what, you know, to follow the law and to, and to make, make certain that they're, 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 uh, they spend, uh, keep holy the Sabbath and to God first and, uh, and no, no other gods beside him. They know those commandments. And if you speak into the Christians, the Christians are given their lives. For the Lord, I believe in the Lord. Off your head, you know, that's it. You know, we know what the early Christians, how, how they suffered because they stood up and recognized the Lord God. So this gospel takes that a little bit further. He says, oh yes, you've recognized the Lord. But that's not all. That's not all it's got, that's, that we're required of. You just say, oh yes, I love the Lord. I have, I find, and then I'll mistreat my brother and sister. No, when he says... He doesn't even say mistreat. He says, feed them. Make them, uh, you know, feed their needs. Clothe them. Visit the sick. Make certain that the sick are, 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 are you know, don't put them, to put them aside. And then those in prison. Oh, you know, you know, in those days, the idea of being in prison, you know, if you were thrown in prison, that meant that the, the authority didn't like you and poof, you got into the prison and you weren't given a, 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 any food to eat. If you got sick there, it's too bad. Many people died just in prison, especially in the Roman prisons. There was nothing. So he says, what do you do? Feed them, make certain that they have their, their, need, their needs are met. And what he's turning to us and saying is, don't look in on yourself and say, oh, I'm just a poor wretch and I'm, I, have, I don't have this and I don't have that. But he's turning to us and saying, God has given you everything. Make him first. By making him first, you put yourself last. And you think of your brothers and sisters. And that's how he will judge us. Because it's a part of being, making God first. It's a part of recognizing the love of God in our lives. Because if I love God so much, then what I am, what I do, is insignificant in this world. As long as I share that love and let other people see that love that God has for me and for them. That's what he judges on. I love this gospel because it, it doesn't turn, it doesn't, <laughs> Jesus doesn't get up and say, and you that did this, and you that did that. No, he doesn't say any of that. He says, see the love of God that it is so important that is so overwhelming that you put yourself aside and you give. You give of yourself. 
making certain that others see that you're the God's love. That's what this is about. What about this other people? You know, I love this uh, the, the part where it says, and the, and the just will say, well, when did we feed you? When did we give you clothing? When did we visit you in prison? And he says, you know. You know when you visited your brothers and sisters, the poor, the hungry. When you, when you gave of yourself, when you put yourself aside and gave to others. That's what he's saying. And by the way, hey, you all heard the, the gospel, right? You don't have that excuse. You know. We all know that when we give to our brothers and sisters, that when we put aside ourselves, that we're doing the Lord's work. We're working with him. I had someone else that came to me the other day, and they said, we're telling me, and I said, you know, I, I have, I'm so overwhelmed with all the work that I do. I have all the things that are, that's happening in my life, and, and I, I'm so overwhelmed, and I just don't have time to, to really feel that God's present to me. And I said, but then you're doing it in the wrong purpose. You're doing it with the wrong notion. Because if you're giving of yourself, then you see God. You have to be able to look at the things that you do, even if sometimes we get so overwhelmed. Are we doing them for ourselves? Are we doing them for others? Christmas is coming. We just had, uh, this is, I love this. It's Black Friday for five days. You know that? You notice that? <laughs> It's Black Friday. I mean, that's, oh, they're still having their tail selling. Get here before Black Friday. I'm like, it's over. And it's gone on, on, and on. And, you know, and it, it, it's sort of like building the fire under people to make them really wacko uh, because of, of Christmas, you know? It's just like, oh, Christmas is coming. I don't have this. And, it's, and you see this uh, uh, with, the, with the merchants trying to get you to buy, buy, buy. And, and the, whole, the whole notion of the celebration of Christmas, the whole notion of, and it's so beautiful that it start, our, the season starts with Thanksgiving because that's where we place ourselves in front of the Lord and say, you're the one, you're the one, Lord, that I, I'm thankful for. <laughs> you're the one that gives me everything. So when Christmas comes, we get also uptight about, oh, with, you know, the house decorated, the trees up, the gifts are wrapped, the bought and wrapped, and, and, and you know, the, the meal was planned, and we go on and on and on. And I always say, I've said this every year, if Jesus were to come the second time on December 23rd, would it make any difference that your tree is decorated? that your houses all look pretty, that you have all those gifts under the tree. What would make any difference? No. What would make a difference is what you've given from your heart. Not wrapped up in packages, but wrapped up with you. That's what this is all about. And I love this, is this is the last Sunday of the liturgical year. And it leaves us with the remembrance of what's most important. What is most important is how we treat each other. Not getting caught up in the fanaticism, the anger that all comes out at Christmas time. We are called to recognize what's most important. And that importance is the love of God and how we share it. Jesus often taught with parables. Those are stories that teach us something about ourselves, like the parable of the sheep and the goats. I don't get it. What do sheep and goats have to do with us? Well, it might help if you understand more about them. First, take sheep. Sheep can't really live on their own. They need a shepherd, and they know how much they need him. So they follow the shepherd closely, and they do what the shepherd says to do. Aww, cute little sheep. Right. Then you have the goats. Goats are stubborn. They do things their own way. They eat anything, even trash. They don't know how much they need the shepherd, so they don't always follow him. Bad, bad goats. 
Exactly. So Jesus tells about a king who went away, but then the king comes back in glory with all the angels to sit on his throne. Like Jesus. Jesus is coming back. Right. Jesus was telling a true story about himself. He is coming back. And when he does, he will separate people like a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Some people will go on his right. Those people are like good sheep? Yes. Jesus will say to the people on his right, Hey, I know you. Come into my kingdom. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I was a stranger, you invited me into your home. When I was in prison, you visited me. Wow, they've been busy. When did they do all those things? Jesus said when they did those things for the least of these, they were actually doing it for him. Wait, the least of these? What's that supposed to mean? It means everyone matters to God, and their needs matter to him too. Even if they can't do anything for you in return or even pay you back. So helping them is like helping Jesus in disguise? Yep, exactly. Then Jesus will talk to the people on his left. Jesus will tell them to go away. Because when he was hungry, they didn't feed him. And when he was thirsty, they didn't give him anything to drink. And when he needed a place to stay, they didn't invite him in. And when he was in prison, they didn't visit. Wait, why would anyone not help Jesus? Hey, I think I see where this is going. Does that mean those people on Jesus' left didn't help others who couldn't pay them back? They probably did things their own way, like goats. Right! Jesus said when they ignored the needs of the least of these, They ignored him. So if we want to do something great for Jesus, We should do something great for people in need and care for them like Jesus does. After all, he's the shepherd. I'm the sheep. 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 Matthew chapter 25 verses 31 through 46. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the kingdom of our father David that is to come. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill and you cared for me, in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, Whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you accursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. A stranger and you gave me no welcome. Naked and you gave me no clothing ill and in prison, and you did not care for me. Then they will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or ill or in prison, and not minister to your needs? He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me and these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord This reading gives us a glimpse into the second coming of Christ.
how can we be sure that it is the second coming and not just an illusion of a false prophet? Let's turn to Zechariah chapter 14 verse 4, On that day his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives which lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by a very wide valley, so that one half of the mount shall withdraw northward, and the other half southward. And the valley of my mountains shall be stopped up, for the valley of the mountains shall touch the side of it, and you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. Then the Lord your God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Matthew 25 verse 32, And all the nations will be assembled before him. In Matthew nations is used to mean all mankind not just individual nations like the United States or Germany. The Son of Man comes in glory, recalls the prophecy of Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 and then the blessed will inherit the kingdom, heaven. When you are a child of God you can look forward to an inheritance much greater than any that can be had on earth. But along with membership in God's family, there are responsibilities some of which are outlined in this reading and Paul expands on the concepts in Romans chapter 12 verses 3 to 8. 3 For by the grace given to me I tell everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than one ought to think, but to think soberly, each according to the measure of faith that God has apportioned. For as in one body we have many parts, and all the parts do not have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually parts of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us exercise them, if prophecy, in proportion to the faith, if ministry, in ministering, if one is a teacher, in teaching. If one exhorts, in exhortation, if one contributes, in generosity, if one is over others, with diligence, if one does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. As you can see, at the final judgment all humanity is to be judged according to the merciful acts of kindness done for our neighbor especially the poor, for the suffering, and for the church. From the book of James chapter 2 verses 24 to 26, we read. See how a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she welcomed the messengers and sent them out by a different route? For just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. The Protestant concept of salvation by faith alone, fails to recognize that once members of God's family, we need to act on our responsibilities as family members or as Jesus says. Matthew 25 verses 45 to 46, He will answer them, Amen, I say to you, what you did not do for one of these least ones, you did not do for me. And these will go off to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Christianity is not just something we do on Sunday, it's a life-changing experience, to be shared with and demonstrated to others. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. C.S. Lewis This is a homily for the Solemnity of Christ the King. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. A very confronting bronze sculpture was installed in St. Peter's Square on September the 29th, 2019. It commemorated the 105th World Migrant and Refugee Day. It was the first time in 400 years since the time of Bernini that a new sculpture had been installed in St. Peter's Square. At the sculpture's inauguration, Pope Francis said that he wanted it to remind everyone of the evangelical challenge of hospitality. The sculpture is dedicated to the world's migrants and refugees. It represents 140 migrants and refugees, not only from different cultures, but also from different historical periods. It's the work of the Canadian sculptor Timothy Schmolz. 
He's named it Angels Unaware. And you can see the wings of an angel rising from the centre of the group. The title of the sculpture comes from a verse in the letter to the Hebrews. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Timothy Schmolz has created a number of other sculptures based on Jesus' words in today's Gospel, and they're located in several public spaces in the city of Rome. The sculpture you can see here is based on verse 35 of today's Gospel. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. This sculpture represents the next verse. I was a stranger, and you made me welcome. And this sculpture, close to the banks of the river Tiber, I was sick, and you visited me. This sculpture is in the grounds of the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. I was in prison, and you visited me. Now each of these sculptures takes the theme of angels unaware one step further. In feeding the hungry, welcoming the stranger, visiting the sick and the imprisoned, it is not an angel that we encounter, but rather Christ himself. You can see quite clearly in these sculptures the wounds of the crucified Jesus in the hands and feet of each of these figures. These sculptures illustrate the words of Jesus in today's Gospel. In so far as you did this to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Jesus himself is the one who was hungry and thirsty, who is sick or in prison. Jesus is the stranger to be made welcome, the naked person to be clothed. Today, Christ the King comes among us, escorted by all the angels. He takes his seat on the throne of glory, and all the nations are assembled before him. He will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates sheep from goats. Now we are still in the Tuesday of Holy Week, as we have been for the previous eight Sundays. Today's story of the Day of Judgment has something in common with the parables that we've heard over the last two Sundays, the parable of the ten bridesmaids and the parable of the talents. They are not stories about doing good or doing evil. No, it's more subtle than that. These are stories about doing good as opposed to doing nothing. All ten bridesmaids had their lamps with them in case the bridegroom arrived after dark. Five of the bridesmaids had oil with them, but the other five had done nothing about getting oil for their lamps until it was too late. And the third servant in the parable of the talents didn't recklessly squander the money entrusted to him. No, he buried it. He did nothing with it. And in today's gospel, those condemned to eternal punishment didn't do anything evil. They just did nothing. When they saw the hungry and thirsty, they did nothing. They didn't make the stranger welcome. They didn't clothe the naked or visit the sick or those in prison. They did nothing. Charles Schultz, creator of Peanuts cartoon strip, once said that if you do not say anything in a cartoon, you might as well not draw it at all. Humour which doesn't say anything is worthless humour. So I contend that a cartoonist must be given his chance to do his own preaching. So here is Charles Schultz's take 
on the theme of today's gospel. On a freezing winter's day, Linus and Charlie Brown pass by Snoopy. Snoopy looks kind of cold, doesn't he? I'll say he does. Maybe we'd better go over and comfort him. Be of good cheer, Snoopy. Yes, be of good cheer. And they walk off, leaving Snoopy in the freezing cold. Lucy wants a document signed. Sign this, please. It absolves me from all blame. And then she then asks the same favour of Linus, Schroeder and Marcy. Sign this, please. It absolves me from all blame. Charlie Brown is a little puzzled. He doesn't understand. Lucy insists and Charlie obliges. Just sign it. That's right. Thank you. But then Lucy explains, no matter what happens any place or any time in the world, this absolves me from all blame. That must be a nice document to have. It's a document that absolves me from doing anything. The Hungarian-born Jewish writer, Elie Wiesel, won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1986. During the Second World War, he was a prisoner in Auschwitz concentration camp. His 1962 novel, The Town Beyond the Wall, tells the story of Michael, who's a young Holocaust survivor, like Wiesel himself. Once the war had ended, Michael wanted to return to his Hungarian hometown. And why? He wanted to satisfy his curiosity. In one sense, he could understand the brutality of the prison guards and the executioners at Auschwitz. What he couldn't understand was the man whom he calls the spectator an individual who lived in an apartment not far from the synagogue, but overlooking the town square. Each day, this man peered down from his apartment window, watching as thousands of Jews were herded into the death trains. Wiesel writes that his face was gazing out, reflecting no pity, no pleasure, no shock, not even anger or interest. Impassive, cold, impersonal. The face was indifferent to the spectacle. What? Men are going to die? That's not my fault, is it? The face is neither Jewish or anti-Jewish. A simple spectator, that's what it is. Nothing to do with me. The novel is, of course, Wiesel's own story, and he offers this reflection. At one point I realised why I wanted to go back to see that man, a man who was indifferent. He saw us in the courtyard, already gathered by the enemy, to be sent off to death. And there he was, indifferent. And I wanted to see him, to confront him. The theme that pervades much of Wiesel's writing and public speaking is that of indifference. He says, I began fighting indifference. I wrote about it. I spoke about it. The millennium lecture I gave in the White House for the President was on the perils of indifference. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. And I went on. The opposite of education is not ignorance, but indifference. The opposite of art is not ugliness, but indifference. The opposite of life is not death, but indifference. It is because of that face that I remember, the face in the window. 
Those sent to eternal punishment in today's gospel are the indifferent, spectators who refuse to get involved. I've spoken before about Dante's great epic, The Divine Comedy. It's the story of a journey to Paradiso, to paradise, that is, to heaven. But before Dante reaches paradise, he must first journey down to the depths of hell, the inferno, and then slowly upwards through purgatory, purgatorio, before entering Paradiso. There are nine levels of hell, with Lucifer at the very bottom of the inferno, surrounded not by fire, but by ice. Dante's vision of hell is a place where the wicked are frozen in misery. Now Dante is accompanied by the poet Virgil as his guide, and here you can see William Blake's lithograph of the scene where Dante and Virgil are about to pass through the gates of the inferno of hell. Above the entrance are the words, Abandon hope, all ye who enter here. No sooner do they pass through the gates and enter what we could call the vestibule of hell, before entering the first of hell's nine circles, they hear sighs, cries, and shrieks of lamentation. Dante is startled, and he asks Virgil, Teacher, what are these sounds I hear? What souls are these so overwhelmed by grief? Here they behold souls who are being stung and stung again by hornets and wasps. Now, because we're in hell, we can assume that they're sinners. But what have they done? What sin have they committed? Well, Virgil explains. This wretched state of being is the fate of those sad souls who lived a life, but lived it with no blame and with no praise stung and stung again by the hornets and the wasps. In other words, here we have the fence-sitters, those who refuse to choose. They did nothing really evil, but neither did they do any good. Because these souls were not passionate about anything during life, they're tormented endlessly by hornets and wasps. And they're also condemned for all eternity to run after a banner. In life, they had no banner, no leader to follow. Now they run around and around and around after a banner endlessly for all eternity. And here, by the way, we have an example of what's known as contrapasso the punishment of a sin by a process that either resembles or contrasts with the sin itself. In this case, the punishment is in stark contrast to the sin. These tormented souls call to mind the judgment passed on the church and Laodicea in the book of Revelation. The first part of the book of Revelation contains a judgment on seven churches in what was then known as Asia Minor, now Western Turkey. The judgment the Lord passes on the church in Laodicea is this. Write to the church of Laodicea. I know about your activities, how you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were one or the other, but since you are neither hot nor cold, but only lukewarm, I will spit you out of my mouth. So today's gospel about the scene of judgment is not about the separation of those doing good from those doing evil, but rather the separation of those doing good from those doing nothing.
Matthew 25 verses 1 to 6. Check your mail, Ruth went to her mailbox and there was only one letter. She picked it up and looked at it before opening, but then she looked at the envelope again. There was no stamp, no postmark, only her name and address. She read the letter. Dear Ruth, I am going to be in your neighborhood Saturday afternoon and I'd like to stop by for a visit. Love always, Jesus. Her hands were shaking as she placed the letter on the table. Why would the Lord want to visit me? I'm nobody special. I don't have anything to offer. With that thought, Ruth remembered her empty kitchen cabinets. Oh my goodness, I really don't have anything to offer. I'll have to run down to the store and buy something for dinner. She reached for her purse and counted out its contents. Only five dollars and forty cents. Well, I can get some bread and cold cuts, at least. She threw on her coat and hurried out the door. A loaf of French bread, a half pound of sliced turkey, and a carton of milk, leaving Ruth with a grand total of twelve cents to last until Monday. Nonetheless, she felt good as she headed home, her meager offerings tucked under her arm. Hey lady, can you help us, lady? Ruth had been so absorbed in her dinner plans, she didn't even notice two figures huddled in the alleyway. A man and a woman, both of them dressed in little more than rags. Look lady, I ain't got a job you know, and my wife and I have been out here on the street, and, well, now it's getting cold and we're getting kinda hungry and, well, if you could help us out we'd really appreciate it. Ruth looked at them both. They were dirty, they smelled bad and frankly, she was certain that they could get some kind of work if they really wanted to. Sir, I'd like to help you, but I'm a poor woman myself. All I have is a few cold cuts and some bread, and I'm having an important guest for dinner tonight and I was planning on serving that to him. Yeah, well, okay lady, I understand. Thanks anyway. The man put his arm around his wife's shoulders, turned and headed back into the alley. As she watched them leave, Ruth felt a familiar twinge at her heart. Sir, wait. The couple stopped and turned as she ran down the alley after them. Look, why don't you take this food? I'll figure out something else to serve my guest. She handed the man her grocery bag. Thank you lady. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. It was the man's wife, and Ruth could see now that she was shivering. You know. I've got another coat at home. Here, why don't you take this one? Ruth unbuttoned her jacket and slipped it over the woman's shoulders. Then smiling, she turned and walked back to the street, without her coat and with nothing to serve her guest. Thank you lady. Thank you very much. Ruth was chilled by the time she reached her front door, and worried too. The Lord was coming to visit and she didn't have anything to offer him. She fumbled through her purse for the door key. But as she did, she noticed another envelope in her mailbox. That's odd. The mailman doesn't usually come twice in one day. Dear Ruth, it was so good to see you again. Thank you for the lovely meal. And thanks for the beautiful coat. Love always, Jesus. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, a stranger and you welcomed me, naked and you clothed me, ill and you cared for me, in prison and you visited me. You might not be able to change the entire world but you can change one life at a time. That's what Ruth was trying to do. For just as a body without a spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Ruth had both faith and works. She brightened the lives of two people, one at a time. Which one of God's children have you helped today?